Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation to speak. And uh, it's a pleasure to speak alongside everybody else who's already spoken. So what I'm going to do today is talk about what we went through at Black Buffalo to uh, meet code adoption requirements associated, associated with AC 509. So just to anchor myself, by show of hands, how many of you have been inside a site printed 3D concrete structure? Oh, you had to have been in. <laughs> so, not many. Okay, now, how many of you on your LinkedIn feed or social media uh, have seen promises from companies maybe like Black Buffalo about how 3D concrete printing is going to take over the world and you, know, you and all your friends and family are going to live in our concrete 3D printed utopia? Oh, okay, yeah, a lot more. Yeah. So, that's the same kind of thought I had about six months ago when I was uh, considering taking an opportunity with Black Buffalo. I was kind of mulling the whole thing over uh, with, with my wife and saying, hey, look, it feels like I'm. So it seems like the time for the technology is right. It seems like the technology is there, right? So you have this mythical product market fit kind of actually lining up. Uh, but codes and standards haven't really seemed to caught up quite yet. Um, and she stopped listening to me like 20 minutes before that. So I just accepted the job offer the next day. And within one day of working at, at Black Buffalo, I started learning about AC509 and what we'd been going through for the previous 20 months to, uh, to get up to speed with code adoption. And I went home that night and I said, hey, I think these guys are on the path. It seems like the printer, the material, the structure, it's all kind of happening now. And again, she stopped listening to me like 20 minutes before I hear the wine uncorking. Um, but I'm here. I'm excited to be here to talk to you because, first of all, you're a captive audience. And second of all, I think this is the right time for the technology. And I think adoption through the ICC is the right first step. So before we can talk about what AC 509 is, we should talk about the scope. And this is the only one that I'll read verbatim because it really, it really is worth listening to. This criteria applies to 3D automated construction technology and 3D concrete used to construct interior and exterior 3D concrete walls with or without structural reinforcing used as bearing walls, non-load bearing walls, and shear walls in single or multi-story unit construction. Okay, so what's as important as what's in there is what's not in there. This is not about slabs. It's not about roofs. It's not about foundation foundations. Uh, this is not about pipe. This is about walls, and that's where the technology is right now. So I think, again, the definition of this is on the right track. So second, why is this allowed for within the umbrella of the IBC? That's because uh, Section 104.11 allows for the alternative materials, and Subsection 1 allows for engineering survey reports, or ESRs, uh, as a source of information on those alternative materials. So that's the byline you're going to hear in the remainder of this is the ESR process. That's the process that Black Buffalo has been going through for almost two years now. And that's what allowed us to be compliant with AC 509. So the guidelines are all, address, all, are all addressing IBC objectives, which is quality, strength, durability, and structural safety. In order to address those objectives, we have to assess the material performance, the durability of that material, the structural evaluation of the composite wall sections, and then finally the quality control and special inspections associated with the printer and the material as well as the site. So why does this matter other than my dinner conversations with my wife? Uh, because this industry is happening. I mean, you just heard from, from ICON, you know, one of the real leaders in this thing, just a few minutes ago. You're hearing from us, Black Buffalo, there are others out there. There's Cobot and there's plenty of companies that are making this happen. So could you imagine if you were pouring slab on metal deck and one week you were using a swing pump and you had to submit all of the information associated with that pump, how it impacts the rheology of the material, uh, what concretes are allowed to be pumped through my open time. And then could you imagine the next week you mobilize a Putzmeister and you had to redo the whole thing? Uh, that's where we are right now in this industry. And that needs to change. Uh, and to add to that, you have, and Jan spoke to this really nicely, you have 
code officials and engineers who don't know what to do with these materials. Are they masonry? So are they going to fall under ACI 531? Or are they cast in place concrete? Will they be ACI 318? How do I design for this? Well, I mean, it looks a lot like masonry. It's got joints in it. I'm, I'm putting it together in, in a similar way. It's stacking on top one to the other, but I'm casting it on site. I'm, I'm not doing it in a factory. So that feels a little bit like ready mix to me. So if we don't have a unified approach, uh, I don't think it's very easy to go uh, from municipality to municipality, continuing to submit applications and engineering designs. And this really prevent, presents a, a unified approach. And on the right hand side, I think Mahmoud and I can both smile in the ESR 4623 that was published this month uh, that has uh, Black Buffalo's name on it. And that's just a depiction of that. So first thing that happens in AC 509 in section one is we define a wall structure. So there, there exist some boundaries here, which is very helpful uh, for where the industry is right now. So you can see on the right side, uh, a triple wide wall, but that's not the AC 509 portion of the wall. The AC 509 portion is the center wife and the lower wife and the concrete that's inside of it. So now we're gonna get into the wonky part. Uh, so the first step of the process is the material evaluation. You'll kind of notice the first few of these, um, even up to the, the fourth one, they look pretty standard. Uh, the fifth one, 4.6 extrusion interval, something we'll spend a little bit of time talking about because that's very specific to 3D concrete printing. I think it's important to go through. So, section 4.2, compressive test and slump, done in a normal fashion. Uh, this can either, either be done with concrete cylinders, like you see here, these four by eight cylinders, or mortar cubes. Uh, freeze thaw durability. I, I see co sitting out there, so I'll say the aptly named C666 because it's pretty difficult to get through. Um, is uh, is something that I've had experience with freeze thaw, um, but it also dictates here, and the uh, the performance criteria is a factor of 80 in this case. Uh, so, and then section 4.4, shrinkage and volume change. If you think about 3D concrete printing, what's effectively happening is you're extruding a long, thin section. In the case of our bead, it would be 20 millimeters high by 57 millimeters wide, and that's what the ESR report says, across the entire length of the building wall. And concrete, we all know, loves to shrink across its cross-section. So controlling that shrinkage and volume change for a fiber-reinforced concrete means keeping that to less than 0.065% change. Um, and practically what that means is a lot of shrinkage reducing admixture. And then finally, fiber compatibility. Uh, this section is more pres prescriptive, so it's not really testing associated with this, but the fibers in your mix have to comply with section 4.5. So this is the one that really matters uh, for the printer to printer uh, basis. Now, the way fundamentally 3D concrete printing works is it's additive manufacture. So imagine my, my floor plan to a building. I'm tracing that floor plan all the way around. And when I'm done with that, I just do it again. And I do it till I'm all the way to the top. But AC509 dictates uh, the rate that, at which I can do that on a minimum and a maximum basis. Now that minimum basis actually ends up being dictated for us, not necessarily by AC509, but by an OSHA requirement. So for a construction robot, which this is, OSHA dictates that you can't exceed a speed of about 10 inches per second. So we found in our testing that that wasn't detrimental to the print, but that subsequent layer times, so we tested this at five minute layer time, 10 minute, 15 minute, up to 45 minute, that as expected, your bond strength decreases across those layers. So we evaluated the flexural strength um, and that's also referenced in, in our ESR report. I think the whole industry has work to do here. It's kind of an exciting part of this to me, uh, but, uh, but we, we did this testing and this also becomes part of the quality control on site. So section 4.7, requires, uh, it really has two components. The first section of 4.7.1 dictates what samples you make and how you report on those samples. So you can see the, the type of tests done as outlined in section 4.7.2. 
on the left hand side you see the picture of our axial testing and then on the on the right hand side the in-plane shear also obviously uh, three-point bending here uh, out of plane shear so simulating things like wind loads are required and the way we did this is by working with ICC the entire time, they at first defined the samples to be produced in section 4.7.1. Then they reviewed our test plan and they provide guidance. We produced the wall samples and then we managed the overall process. So we were involved really at every stage of this and we paid. Intertech Labs performed all of our destructive testing. So the work you see here was done at Intertech Labs. And they performed the durability testing as well. We hired an outside structural engineering company to do the analysis. And really what we did there is we said, okay, these are the results that we're seeing from the destructive testing. How can we fit this into existing codes, whether they're TMS codes, a, uh, ACI codes? And we worked to define how those codes govern our structure, our wall structures. The ICC evaluated this and you can see the kind of positive feedback loop going on here. There was a lot of iteration, we had a lot of calls. And uh, we finally got to the point where we issued uh, an ESR report this month. So finally, the QC requirements associated with this. Uh, be mindful of time. A little bit of time. Okay. Every printer is labeled. So you, what you see here is a Black Buffalo Nexcon 1G printer, and so every axis of this of this printer and every major component is labeled with a unique serial code. Uh, that's subject to uh, to inspection and maintenance. Our concrete mix, so where we make our concrete mix is going to be inspected twice per year and there's quality documentation associated with that uh, concrete mix and printer. And then finally we have to do inspections at both the technology centers, the material centers, as well as on-site testing. So this allows for compressive tests and then the bond layer tests as well. So just a couple, a couple charts here that I'll go over and I think Again, you know, Icon and Jan touched on this really nicely, uh, is where are we now on 3D printed materials and where are we looking to go? That's from a customer setup that I did in Austin recently. It's pretty beautiful. So where we are now, uh, we have high performance mixes. They're effectively dry mortars for us, just like they are for Icon. Uh, and that material is consistently testing over 10,000 PSI in compression. Again, we're looking at a very conservatively designed material. Hopefully we can start changing this in time, but right now this is where we are. Uh, reducing the clinker content by using supplementary cementitious materials you know, increases the performance of, its mix, of the mix in the fresh states and the cured states, and things like slag and flash lower the embodied CO2. We're using fiber as well to improve the shrinkage control. And we have a finely tuned admix strategy to make sure that the material performs consistently job site to job site across different environments. And where are we going next? Uh, there's a lot of things going, we've heard about a couple of them today, a lot of things going on in the world of alternative SCMs. Um, activated posilins are a great answer to the supply chain issues along with synthetic SCMs that we're seeing, uh, fly ash shortages, slag shortages, and CO2 mineralization will also help to drive sustainability uh, in 3D concrete printing. I come from a CO2 mineralization background, having worked on that for basically the last decade at a company carbonating calcium silicate based cements. Uh, and secondly, adaptive batching. I think we heard about some of this already, uh, but I'll tell you what I think that means. One of the tricks about this material is understanding the rheological behavior of the material in its mixed state, in the state sitting in the pump, and then again at the nozzle. So I have several locations where I'm carefully managing the mixes of the, the concrete properties. And understanding that behavior across its life, all the way to the print, is what is going to allow this to be done uniquely across environments. Uh, and the way we start to do this is by capturing data from our mixers and integrating that data with environmental controls because we all know we're managing for evaporation. So what my wind speed is at any given time, what my temperature and relative humidity are, and how that material is responding. As I'm pumping concrete through the pump the entire day, at the end of the day, the hoses get really warm, and that makes it challenging to continue to, to print. So managing that with adaptive batching is going to be critically important for us going forward. Continuing to reduce the cement content. We all know, everybody's heard it before, a ton of CO2 per ton of cement. Uh, 
I think probably three of the four speakers have been talking about, about this as well. And then the use of local materials. There's a significant sand shortage, uh, specifically of angular sands. And we know that we're going to have to use less than optimal aggregates in the future. And also starting to utilize uh, larger aggregates in sand is something that we need to start thinking about. Uh, there are some guys out there already doing this. This is, this is being done by some 3D concrete printing, and we hope to be there as well in the future. That's all I got. Similar question that I asked previously. Um, you um, have some uh, real field experience uh, right now, and can you share any quantified benefit um, using 3D computing? Sure. Um, where I see things right now is certainly in speed. Uh, we can conservatively say uh, we, could we could continuously print uh, a 600 square foot structure in around a day, uh, a long, one long day. Uh, so speed is certainly a benefit. I think also one of the things that I'm seeing being in the construction industry is a little bit of a brain drain sometimes. And as we integrate technology, we start to attract different types of people into the industry. So we're getting a lot of interest across not only academia, but from trade schools. And I think that if we're going to sustain the construction industry, we're going to need advancements like this to kind of help bring people into the fold. Something I find exciting, at least. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, what would happen if you want to build a whole house using 3D printing? What do you do with your floors or beams? How do you break them like, 10 feet above the ground? Yeah, so that, uh, we're not doing that right now. I think that is in the future. Right now, this is really a wall system. So normally, you would have your slab on grade or your footing placed and then we would pour the walls. Now, you could start to think about how you might do things like slab on deck uh, or possibly even roof. Now, does that require ultra high performance concretes, right? Because concrete typically is not very good intention. So these are the kinds of things we're starting to think about. Right now, to my knowledge, none of that's being done. It's just a wall structure at the moment. Thanks for your question, it's a good one. Thank you for the presentation. As a matter of fact, I have one question which is related to a number of questions and uh, one comment. Uh, first, most of the 3D printing companies they are focusing on the wall. While the slab and the beams not yet big. Second, with respect to the wall, what would be the design mechanisms if it is going to be very cool? How would that be conducted? Thank you. So, thank you for the question. So, for our ESR report, our wall, which is approved up to 40 feet, is two wides of our 3D concrete printed ink, which is we use a, a ink called Planetop 3D, uh, and that's the approved mix for, for our ESR report. And it's filled with grout. Uh, and the, the only other thing inside of that wall is lattice reinforcement. That's placed approximately every 10 layers or 200 millimeters, and that's horizontal joint masonry reinforcement, nine gauge. What is that design? How to How to design. So I would direct you to the ESR report because several codes are referenced and several equations are referenced in that ESR report. Some of those are TMS equations, others of those are ACI 531 equations. So I think your best bet would be to look at the ESR report, which is available now. Thank you very much.